Hello, everyone. Um, it's Francis Healy here again for Mental Voices and Global Net 21. Um, this is one of our regular interviews we do where we interview people making a difference locally, nationally, and sometimes globally. And today we have with us Alison Gordon, who's from Enfield Age UK. And we're going to talk about the work that she's doing. Okay, Alison, thank you very much for joining us today. And it's great that you, you can be here and tell us about the work you do. Well, first of all, then, tell us a bit about yourself and what led you to Age UK and what you do there. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Alison, and I joined Age UK Enfield in June, late June 2019. Um, my specialism in life is dementia. And um, I was drawn to working with people affected by dementia from a very early age, um, from having paternal grandparents that had um, dementia, and it gave me an interest in wanting to improve people's lives. So I think it's a fair thing to say that I've always had an interest um, in working with people, older people and working with people to improve their quality of life. Um, and over the last couple of years, I've really worked in the community to connect people in community development roles. Um, and building resilience and helping people to come together. So it's like a natural progression to want to work for a, a charity such as HUK um, and bring my experience. Okay, so you connect people. And um, I mean, how do you do that? I mean, do you go, I mean, the older population is growing all the time as people yes. are living longer. Um, so how do you make contact with them? How do you connect? You go out and find them or do people come to you? We have lots of things happening at HUK and Enfield. So we, as we have um, an information and advice service, which is an open door Monday to Wednesday before nine o'clock, people sort of arrive on our doorstep before we even open. So people know about us in that respect um, and people come to us that way. We have a lot of telephone calls in. I think having a brand name like HUK is, is a nationally recognised name. Um, so again, it instills trust in people and people contact us that way. I have a team of um, ICANN navigators who work with people in the community um, and they have community drop-ins in the libraries throughout um, Enfield, also in GP practices. Um, we have peer support sessions for specific conditions. We have um, tea and chatter groups. Uh, we have our walks. We have fit for life classes. We're actually out in the community so much that hopefully there's always somebody that can connect with us. And, um, you know, what, what are the major demands uh, around your services? Um, what do people come to you mostly for? It feels like there's an awful lot of people at the moment that come for us for information and advice with the changes to the government and the stress that people are feeling economically, financially, um, housing issues. There's, there's lots of reasons why people will come to us for information and advice. But then also equally, we see people that are feeling isolated and vulnerable and, you know, their families moved away or... They haven't got any friendships and so they come to us to sort of connect to other people. Um, we have a big cohort of volunteers actually, so lots of people that want to find something to do with their time. Um, and we're very proud of our volunteers, so our volunteers support everything that we do. Um, and again, our, our exercise classes are pretty popular as well, especially on our, our Trent Park walk and our, um, our line dancing class is very popular. So there's lots of reasons why people come from the very simplest things and actually answering the telephones, you'd be surprised what people do phone and call us for actually. Okay, so you do, you do all those things, including line dancing, which I won't join in on. <laughs> um, but but a, a lot of your work must, uh, you know, sort of be around care and support. I mean, what can you provide there? So we also have um, a home-based domiciliary care service, which we support older people with. Um, and so that has practical tasks, it has domestic tasks and also home care, so more um, personal care um, and companionship. So there's a service that runs from Monday to Sunday, 365 days of the year in a community there. Um, and we also have a specialist day service at the Parker Centre, which is in Edmonton, um, which has older people and people affected by dementia. And it's very popular, it's very busy. Um, there's two floors to our building and so we have people from maybe early stages of dementia right up to advanced stages of dementia that attend there. And we also have a foot care service which runs from the Parker Centre as well. So we have like a wealth of information, wellbeing services and then directly provided care services as well. So quite a lot, quite a lot happening. I mean, you say you have these things. Are these a part of Age UK or are they yes. independent organised? They are. They are, yeah. They're yeah. part of the services that we offer. 
Yeah. But presumably you also work with other groups, like for example, the Ruth Winston House or um, the yes. Build Over 50s Forum. I mean, do you have a network of connectivity there with organisations as well? Yes, I believe so. And some, so some of our contracts that we have are in partnership with our local voluntary sector agencies like um, Crossroads and Alpha Care. And we have connections out to everybody really within the community. And we've been doing some work recently um, on the social prescribing models with um, Enfield Disability Action and Enfield Voluntary Action. We've also connected to Enfield Connections. We had a meeting of over 50s forums. So being new into post um, alongside my new CEO, we've been connecting quite a lot into the wider community and, and meeting new you know, organisations and reaffirming relationships with people, I think. you know. So yes. And, it's, and we have a good connection with Rumi Mosque, which is in Edmonton, who do some fabulous community work. And it's, it's kind of quite endless, the number of organisations. Um, the Methodist churches have contacted us to do further work. And we're very grateful for everybody that comes you know, all the time, continuously, and wants to do joint work with us. Tell, tell us a bit about the, the, what, what you've just said now, social prescribing, what that is. I mean, a lot of us know, a lot of people won't. And, you know, you know how that will impact on the well-being of people who actually are prescribed that way socially. Sure. So, I mean, social prescribing in itself isn't actually a new model. Um, the Bromley by Bow Centre, I think, was established in 1985, which is in Tower Hamlets. Um, and people... Uh, have become more aware of social prescribing in the last you know, last couple of years. Um, and the initiative has been driven forward this year at an accelerated rate with the primary care networks being formed and the doctors being requested to employ GP link workers. But the voluntary sector has had models of social prescribing throughout the country for the last few years. And, and for anyone who's unsure of what the um, social prescribing is, it's a way of connecting people um, and it's a way of looking at people holistically and because most people that come along to a GP practice will come along maybe with a physical ailment, but there's something else going on there as well. It may be that they're worried about debt or their relationships broken up or they feel isolated. And so they're attending a GP or attending anywhere actually, but just to focus on GPs for the moment, the GP often feels that they have people that are taking up time when it's not medically related problems. And so the social prescribers become quite an asset to them because then they connect to the wider picture of what's happening in the community. Um, so our social prescribing model is our, is our ICANN service, and they've been doing that for the past 18 months, nearly two years. Um, and they sit within GP practices and they meet with people um, and then they walk alongside people and help them to achieve their goals. We, we work in a very strength-based way. So rather than looking at people's deficits, when people come to us and say, I've got diabetes or I've got this, I've got that, we look at what their best strengths are as well what do they like to do what makes them feel happy what's their quality of life what, what would improve their quality of life and we work with them to achieve that so, so the social describing model is really about um, enhancing people's lives helping to build resilience helping communities to become stronger and helping people to access things and if the things that they want to access aren't available looking at solutions of ways we, we achieve that so that's where community development comes in Okay, I mean, do you get the cooperation of all the GPs in the borough? I mean, do you have some that resist that or are they cooperative over this? I think the GPs um, are very interested and very curious. Um, it, for, for lots of GP practices, um, it's a new concept. Some of them are very established and have been working in this manner in some of our neighbouring boroughs. Um, and some of them are obviously nervous because it's a new concept and they're worried about the work that can go into it. But it has got um, value value to, to the services they're offering, it'll take the demand of the pressure of GPs and that's the aim of everything we're doing really so that we can we can prevent our statutory services being demolished by the pressure they're all under at the moment. So yeah, I mean it's so far so good, I think is the answer to that one. We've actually got two GP link workers that have started. Um, we have four primary care networks within Enfield um, and one of the GP link workers started in July um, and the second one has just started this week. So they're actually employed directly by their primary care networks. And so we're working in partnership with them to help them get rolling and um, support them in the development of their work as well. It's exciting. Yeah. Okay. I, I remember um, way back in the late 70s and 80s, you know, way back in history, I was involved in developing a, uh, a community agency in Enfield. And one of the groups that came in 
was a group based on a group of churches in Winchmill Hill that provided lots of services, but particularly community transport. Now, you know, for a lot of people, getting out and about is difficult. Do you, you provide you provide that? Do you provide community transport, or do you have links with people that do? Yeah, tr transport is the biggest issue that everybody seems to have, um, and, and we get numerous calls every day about people needing someone to accompany someone to a doctor's or to a hospital appointment. Um, we, we have people that come and ask us to support them in making applications for blue badges and for GP taxi cards and for dial rides, um, but we don't actually have any formal transport services apart from for our directly provided daycare service. Um, all the events in the community, there's an expectation that people can make their own way there. Um, and interestingly enough, I think this sits in with community development. Um, I think everybody has an expectation that somebody has to reach to a different part of the, of the borough. And sometimes, you know, the financial costs or, or, or the, the ability to do that is impossible. So kind of creating these very small community areas within the wards that people live in is, is the way forward, really, so that we connect people that want to do things within their areas and assets that we have in those areas and, and then make that available for local people. I think that's probably the way forward because, you know, transport is a very difficult thing to resolve. The magic wands, I think that would be the thing that everybody wants, but it's just so costly as well. Yeah. Do they come to you if they want community transport? How do they find out about it? I think mostly we get people that come to us for um, blue badges. I mean, we get lots of people under the information and advice, so they'll come to us for blue badges and, and, and then they'll be made aware of things like GP taxi cards and dial rides because I think a lot of people don't know about what's um, accessible to them. Um, People don't actually come to us for community transport. I wouldn't say, uh, you know, I'm not wearing an information and advice hat at the moment, so it'd be interesting what my colleagues would say about that. But I don't think um, generally, only when people kind of want to go to something in particular, then they struggle with it, they might come for, for um, People come and ask us about how can people get to appointments, with, you know. Yeah, yeah sorry, okay. that's a bit of a vague answer that's to you there, Francis. Oh, well, that's okay. No, no, that, that, that's fine. Um, I mean, let's go on to something else. I mean, there has in recent years been uh, quite a lot of cuts in health and social mm -hmm. services, which has affected elderly people. But yes. how has it affected you and what you do? I think it's affected absolutely everybody within the sector. I think, you know, at the moment, our information and advice service is, is it, you know, it's, it's very much under pressure. I mean, I, I come into the office and there's a queue of 15 people some days. Um, we only have an open office on, on a Monday to Wednesday currently, um, and we're looking to review that and extend that back due to the demands and the complexities that older people are facing are no different to working age people now with the benefit system reform, the housing situation, you know, the, 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 all, the, all the difficulties with the health appointments. So it's dramatically affected us. And of course, that once upon a time, charities used to receive core funding to sustain them, and, and that doesn't happen anymore. So we have to look at alternative ways of being funded and creating fundraising and be quite creative you know to keep ourselves going so there's, there's a dramatic effect i think the shrinkage of the local provider services in an ideal world would have meant that the voluntary sector picked up on all of that work but unfortunately the funding to the voluntary sector has been affected too so it's been very difficult especially for very small charities very small grassroots charities have probably been really hammered the most by it it's about connecting and working together collaboratively. You know, we need to be, as a voluntary sector, we need to be really strong and work together. And I think that's the overall feel I've got from joining Enfield, that the voluntary sector feels like that. And it's, and it's very different from the other neighbouring boroughs that don't have that cohesion. So, so one of the solutions to having to deal with, uh, you know, declining resources is collaboration, working together. Yes. But, that, but I also notice that you're looking at other models as well, yes. like developing resilience, what you call a, a strength-based approach, where you look at the gifts and talents people have. Now, this is sometimes called, isn't it, an ABC approach, asset-based yes. community development. Tell us how you're doing that, because we've done quite a few webinars on that with Cormac Duffy, who is um, uh, one of the leading experts on that in this country. And Wonderful. the approach yeah. is a really, really interesting one. Absolutely. So um, I had, in the last two years, two and a half years of my personal life, my, my professional life, I was involved in a project which was absolutely ABCD um, and it was all again about connecting people in, in these small community hub areas so that you're responsible for an area, you got to know absolutely everybody in that area, 
or all their assets, which were the you know, community faith groups, the local businesses, um, and bringing people together, bringing people together in discussions, in, in, in conversations, not focus groups where people are invited to come along, just having these natural discussions. And that type of work is what the ICANN service is looking to do um, so because they're kind of geographically based throughout the borough and having those kind of conversations with people, forming those connections, listening to what the residents and community want and taking things forward. So it could be that there's a cafe on Turkey Street who want to provide two meals free a week to people, but people don't know about it. So it's connecting that back to the people in there that need it. And so it's about having these really honest and frank conversations and, and being out there, being visible, and people knowing you're the person to come to, um, which is what we're planning on doing. It's a bit of an expansion. It's a bit of a new way of working in, in our traditional field. In a way, it's, a, it's an old way of working, isn't it? It's I mean, a very old way of working, actually. I started yeah. in, in care work, you know, in the care sector and adult social care about 25 years ago. Um, and traditionally, social workers worked in patches as long, as long with nurses did. And, you know, you had a, a, a community hub which had multidisciplinary staff and everybody knew that person and knew to go to that person. And, of course, over the years of many changes, that's been disbanded. And obviously some bright sparks gone, actually, let's bring that way of working back in again because it works. And, yeah, but it's and value and contribution, you know. It's even older than that, really. It's about the community helping itself, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. about building from the bottom up and yes. finding what strengths people have and empowering those strengths within yes. the community. Absolutely. Yeah, I can't agree with you more. And, and I think in such a transient place like big cities like London, it's very difficult, isn't it? Because people are, are moving or people are having to work lots of hours. And so that kind of knowing your neighbours and looking out for people is, is somewhat changed. And so it's about bringing that back. And, and there are groups of people that really, really want to do that. And there's groups of people that are really interested. And it just takes that connection, bringing those people together and connecting them to people, you know, because people do look out for each other. You know, if somebody's at work all day, they might move their bins for them to prevent somebody coming along and burgling them. There's that kind of feel. It's tapping into all of that. And I mean, also one of the biggest problems we're facing today is loneliness. Yes. Um, now, I mean, you have a befriending service, I think, and maybe you could tell us about that. But do you, do you do other things? For example, I, I see that some people are looking at the digital revolution and looking yes. at Alexa, looking at Skype and looking at yes. how they can connect people in a way that is quite new in the 21st century in order to actually connect people and make them feel that there is someone out there they can talk to. What yes. do you do around that? There's some very interesting models out there and actually some, some of our team have got some personal interest in um, some developments that are out there of, of, of telecare and um, connecting people through those kind of models. Um, we do have a befriending service. Um, our befriending service, um, we're considering reviewing slightly. Um, it's, it's not been working in the way, um, I'm trying to think the best way to put that, it's, it's kind of not been working for, before, since before I started. So we're looking at that as one of our portfolio of changes. Um, I think, I mean, I think the navigators that we have, so we have care navigators that um, meet people in the community and then signpost them and actually accompany people to sort of go to local activities is one way we're addressing isolation. We've actually just, we've rolled a people's week, we've booked in a conversation um, so that people can come in and tell us how they feel and what needs to change. So like beginning of those community conversations about how do you feel, what can you contribute, um, and looking to roll that out across the borough. Um, so I think the, in answer to that, I think the way that we are trying to address isolation is working in partnership with London Borough of Enfield and the other voluntary sets and agencies. Um, we have the navigation services, we have the ICANN service, we have the falls and the memory and frailty. We also have the day services, we have the home-based services, the befriending services being remodeled. We've got the opportunities for volunteering. We've got the developing um, activities where we are often approached by people that have specialisms that want to run groups, like we've got discussion about chess beginners groups at the moment, um, the tea and chatter groups. It, it feels like there's numerous ways of people that can get out. The difficulty is the people that can't get out. And I think that's an area that everybody's concerned about there's certainly a lot of discussions within um, many meetings that we attend about isolation in, in Enfield at the moment. So I don't think there's a one size fits all for that, actually, because, again, there's telephone services. There's, there's so much. No, I mean, we, we did something with a, a, an organisation that was sort of 
looking at how Alexa could be developed to actually get older people to talk to it because very yes. often they not chat, but they would chat to this machine. They found yes. older people would talk to it. Yeah. And it's a really great way of, um, you know, getting them to have someone there and to find out all the information they want. Have you ever looked at that? It's something I'd definitely be interested in. I have heard other people talking about it. I'm, I'm quite open to anything which is going to work in, in numerous ways. I'm really keen to, to listen to what the, um, our residents want. You know, to me, community conversations are, are the way forward. And certainly with the approach that I was working in in my last role, it was, it was very much led by what the community wanted rather than what we thought the gaps were. So it's, it's really listening to what they want. And, and quite often I find with older people, the difficulty about the digital switchover is, is a huge issue and, and, you know, wanting things to be more on paper and wanting things to be in a way which is opposing where we're being dragged along to the digital change as well. So we've got a big piece of work on that too. Though I gather Silver Surfers are the biggest growing group on the internet. So I believe so, yeah. yeah so I believe so. Um, you also help people plan, don't you, before they get old for their later yes. life, which is important. Do you want to tell us about that? So we have um, a very small pocket of contracts for um, providing advice and information support on later life planning. Um, and that works with people to have an understanding about lasting power of attorney, uh, wills and funerals. Um, and she's available to see people one-to-one, -one, but she's also available to go to groups and do dis um, talks and discussions and talk about the full range of products and what's available to people in, in an unbiased way. We're not, we're not promoting our own services in any shape or form. We're just trying to make people aware of the benefits of planning earlier. Um, you know, all of us would benefit from having lasting power of attorney regardless of our age because things can change very suddenly and it just prepares you for the future. So that's a very interesting piece of work. We've got some scheduled talks coming, actually. I think we've got one on the 27th of September and I'll be able to share that afterwards. Okay, um, so you, you, you do a lot of service provision, you do a lot of connecting. Do you also do campaigning? You're involved in campaigning on behalf of older people to government and local government? Yes, I mean, AGK nationally and AGK local um, have some very important campaigns that we support. There's a newly released campaign. Um, you have to forgive me. Uh, that sits slightly outside of my remit at the moment. You know, I feel like I'm juggling lots of hats at the moment and trying to stay up to date on all of them. Um, but that might be a, 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 something we'll be revealing in, a, in the next few weeks on that one. We, we, we kind of sit in a unique position. I'm not quite sure if people understand how AGKs work. We're independent. So our, our neighbouring AGKs may be doing slightly different services to us. We're offering slightly different support. So again... We're doing some work at the moment about working and building um, around our other AGK colleagues in different areas and obviously with, with our national office as well. So, but I mean, that's national and that's national uh, AGK and yeah. obviously they, they do a lot of um, advocacy work. What about locally? I mean, what sort of issues would you take up with the local authority to try and improve life for older people? So we are part of Older Persons Board's um, voluntary sector early intervention and prevention meetings um, and probably numerous others. There's, there's so many different parts of the wellbeing boards and partnerships. Um, and we obviously contribute there from feedback from, from our experiences and from what local residents are telling us and advocate on their behalf as much as possible at meetings. So lots of discussions I can tell you all are around this new, new approaches, the new about innovative ways of working, the ways about, again, building resilience, reducing isolation. Um, there's obviously um, concerns around like, you know, uh, safety and safeguarding and, and hoarding and housing. There's, 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 there's so many different topics that we're involved in. <laughs> um, we're just constantly collecting and, and talking to people and passing back and working alongside people in the best way that we can. I really welcome anybody um, who may be listening today, if, if they're interested in joining us to have some locally led community, community conversations that we can feed up to, LB would be really useful. That'd be really helpful. You, you, you actually have age champions, don't you, who uh, are used to actually look at what's happening locally, keep you informed and act as advocates as well. Yes, yes, yes. And we welcome more of those as well. Anybody actually who has time on their hands who wants to help out. It feels like there's a bit of an explosion at the moment of interest in so many things. 
and you know there's, there's so many areas it's it's quite difficult trying to sort of stay on track with so many things at the moment so yeah we welcome volunteers and experience and voices of experience certainly yeah i mean as you know getting volunteers is always difficult and sustaining yes. volunteers yes. is more difficult so i mean if people wanted to volunteer what sort of things would they do with you Absolutely everything, actually. We, we Our volunteers man our reception and our telephone lines on a Monday to Friday basis. Um, we have information and advice volunteers who have specialisms. And so we really would welcome anybody who has a background in anything like housing or social work or benefits. If they want to join the information and advice team, we'd be fantastically grateful. Um, or in future planning, um, we have people that Come and sit and talk to people we have people that contribute to the day services we have people that come and wash up in the day services we have walk leaders um, the ICANN navigators have people that take telephone surveys and do administrative duties literally I think there's a role for everybody in anything and, and I, you know it's, it's kind of endless and limitless and anybody that wanted to speak to us about volunteering we'd happily talk to them about what they could contribute I mean I think again in an asset-based way of thinking anyone's gifts and talents are welcome so, I mean, do you have a, a volunteer coordinator for that? We do, yes. Contact? So our volunteer coordinator sits under our customer services team, um, Daniela, um, and she would welcome any conversations with anybody. You can contact us via our telephone number, or via our email or for our Facebook page, or by letter. We still get letters as well, which is lovely. <laughs> <laughs> can you remind me, what is a letter? <laughs> <laughs> I had a couple the other day. Yes. <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay, but I mean, get close to the end now, but we know that the elderly population is going to get larger now as yes. years go by. We know that resources are limited. We know that you're looking at innovative things like the strength-based approach and so on, collaboration. I mean, as the population, the older population gets larger, how do you think you will cope in the future? I mean, is it going to be a daunting task? I think it, the, the present, I think, is quite daunting for lots of people. I think there's a whole period of uncertainty for many people. And I think lots of people that are ageing now have very difficult circumstances. It's, it's a very diff difficult time with lots of housing issues, lots of uncertainty, lots of people worrying about paying for care, um, losing their assets, losing their properties. So, so I think that we just have to kind of like keep keep calm and carry on I think is probably the best way I think that obviously there will you know necessarily won't necessarily be an increased demand I mean the, the idea would be if we could start to educate people at an early age to build some forms of resilience it you know in the aim that lots of our preventative work is doing but, you know I, I think we're a bit stuck on that one Francis to be honest with you I mean I think the demand is always going to be there and there's always going to be people that need information and advice regardless about how much things are accessible to people, there's always going to be people that need support to navigate through things and support to understand things. So, yeah, we've just got to keep going. I think. Yeah, I mean... So, it, yeah, hopefully it, I, we'll grow and expand and hopefully we'll, we'll have more money ourselves to be able to employ more people, to be able to help others or have a huger bank of volunteers. Yeah. I mean, it must be difficult to plan for the far future because yes. you've got so many pressures on doing what you have to do now. Yes, Yes, that's, that's, the, that's the answer to that. Yes, right now it feels very difficult, let alone planning for the future. But obviously we have to look at the NHS long-term conditions plan and, and all the other documents that are coming through. So it is quite difficult. But, but I mean, you must have a, a real sense of purpose in your organisation and the volunteers must feel that mission is really valuable to them, create self-worth for them as well as for the people they work with. Absolutely. And, and I know that the, the National AGK has been pulling us all together to have big conversations again about our aims and aspirations. And it's, it's, it feels very um, rewarding. You, you feel like you really are involved with an organisation that really does listen and care and is pushing the way forward for older people's voices and, you know, healthy ageing and ageing better. It, it feels it's something we've all been very passionate about, I think. And, as a local organisation, I can certainly, like, even though I've only been here for a few months, I can feel the dedication and, you know, and the commitment that all the volunteers and the staff have. And it was a great organisation to be part of, actually. I'm glad to join them. OK, well, I mean, it's obviously great work you're doing and we've sort of come to the end of this now. But do you want to finally tell us, I mean, you've told us a bit before, but 
people want to use your service, volunteer for your service, get involved in any way, where do they go? What do they do? Okay, so our main office is based at John Jackson Library, which is in Agricola Place, um, Bushill Park. And we moved from our Ponders Inn's Ponders base to this place. Um, our main contact telephone number is 0208 375 4120. Um, we also have a customer services at agkenfield.org.uk email address. Or you're welcome to contact me, Alison Gordon, um, on the same number, or my email is alison.gordon at agkenfield.org.uk. And I'll be happy to talk to anybody and pass on to my appropriate colleagues. Okay. All right. Well, that's great. I mean, thank you for that. I mean, you've told us a lot about what you do and, uh, and how volunteers are involved um, and, and what you hope for the future, given the resource shortages you have. So, you know, it's been a really interesting interview. Um, thank you so, for the time. Much appreciated. Well, thank you for coming on and I appreciate you coming on as well. So thank you. And we'll uh, end this webinar now.